they heard they did not see pictures. You're correct. Okay. All right, good. Oops. So I just have to show you this picture of my granddaughter, of course. Let's see. Now, how do I go back here? <laughs> there she is. All right, there's a picture of Anya with all of us. We went out you know, last week, I think it was a week, a week ago, and picked all these good, wonderful things for supper. Um, I think it's one of the most wonderful things, fun things about being a farmer or a gardener is being brought and pick your food supper. But just keep an eye on the vibrancy of these of these um, vegetables. I think specifically right now, these beets are just really in super high quality. You can see the dark uh, purple color of the beet and the strong stems and the really vibrant leaves and everything else on that breadboard is looking really good. And I really want to um, thank the... Uh, the no-till system for that. <clears throat> All right. No. There we go. All right. So I was saying there there are some principles um, that I call, uh, you know, provide you the biological happiness, which is what we're looking for. Happy mycorrhizal fungi. They're the ones who run the show. And if we um, are making making the soil system uh, conducive to their growth and, and flourishment, we're going to have a good situation. So little or no disturbance of the soil is really important. Armor on the surface. So we don't really want that nice, soft, rich uh, dirt or soil or whatever you call it. Um, we need to have stuff on it, whether it's something green growing or it's uh, stubble or um, something that is going to keep the keep the uh, carbon from leaking out, number one, and also from the rain and sun from really destroying the, the topsoil. Diversity is always an important thing. Um, lots and lots of different um, vegetable crops, animal crops, you know, lots of bees and flowers and everything. And, and the more diversity you have, the more um, health we have in the system. Living roots in the ground are really important as much as possible, as long as possible into the year, and then animal integration. And I really feel um, fortunate that we our place is big enough that we can have these animals. Um, and we really make sure that our one of our types of livestock, at least, or perhaps two, um, go over our vegetable land and through our orchards and all of our fruit areas and such. Um, at least once a year, um, and, and they're manuring on their way by. It, it has proven to be very helpful for us. Um, there's something that we want to think about um, when we have improved soil organic carbon, and, and it's really about we're really farming to bring more carbon out of the atmosphere and into this back into the soil. That's that's one of our real goals. But when you have that happening, you see an enhanced yield potential, um, enhanced yield stability. So uh, that means, you know, things are, are consistent and they last longer. Improved product quality. We're going to have um, healthier crops that are sound, more sound and taste better and hold up longer. Improving the soil quality, rich and full of life. That's a pretty obvious one. Improving soil workability. Um, we want to be able to work with the soil in a way where it's not too hard or too wet, um, uh, too, you know, too muddy. Uh, as it, this, this year, for example, a lot of us have been struggling with a lot of rain. We had another big rain event today, and we really didn't need it. Um, but we're improving that. We're improving biodiversity um, when we have all this carbon um, in the soil where it belongs, you're going to see a lot more activity from all sorts of life. Improving the water holding capacity. So when you do have a really heavy rainy year like this, you're not going to get washed away. Um, and improving infiltration and drainage. Um, infiltration um, is important, particularly um, when you have heavy rain events, but also when you don't have enough rain. You want every drop to make it into the soil. And that's really an um, important aspect of having better carbon um, in the soil. Lessening the need for irrigation, lessening the need for fertilizer, lessened pests and disease pressure, lessened erosion, and lessened leaking of nutrients into the subsoil or even worse, into the waterways. So that's what we're 
know what's what we're looking for and what we're really noticing in a system that's got better uh, soil organic uh, carbon. I want to talk a little bit about our fertility protocol. Um, we do a Logan Labs soil test in September, right about now. Actually, I should have done it last week, come to, come to think of it, and see where we stand. And we, then we do the dry mineral applications. Um, a lot of those should be done in the fall. I often don't have enough you know, financial uh, capability this time of year, so we'll put stuff down you know, as soon as I get it from the bulk order in the spring. Um, it's a time um, where we have really gone, gotten to a place where we don't really need as much fertilizer as we used to need, and it was mostly rock powders and such, but um, we're now using more things like wood chips. Um, we get about 10 tractor trailer loads of those every year to use on our two and a half acres of vegetables and our acre of, of fruit. Um, we amass hay. Uh, we have our own raised on the farm, but we also buy in a lot of hay. Um, and we use worm castings and KNF, which is um, Korean natural farming practices. We're actually moving away from both of those things a little bit. Um, and we kind of covered up our worm bins, which were going to be a struggle for our certification coming up forward. So I, I'll show you what we built there, a bioreactor. It's called composter. Um, and we find we have so many worms uh, in the soil now that we don't really feel that we need so much need those worm castings. We this year used for a kind of a balanced fertilizer pro grow, which is a NCO product, North Country Organic product, at planting, and then uh, drenching at planting um, with fertility, biostimulants, microbial inoculants. Um, PlantSure has been our kind of new basic uh, liquid fertilizer and then we've been moving a lot more into I have in the past but kind of coming back to the AEA advancing eco agriculture some of their products accelerate which is a standard we use every week in our foliars micro 5000 which is a um, bio, it's a microbial uh, inoculant from tiny technologies spectrum which is another um, Biostimulant and BioCoat Gold, which is a microbial inoculant. So these are all things that are really going to and used in very small quantities. You know, very inexpensive um, investment, uh, along with your liquid fertility products, and then seed crop a little bit of that to bring in a lot of trace minerals. So that's what we do is drenching when we plant, and we also do that in a foliar feed every every week. Um, so um, we found during this period where we had that six weeks of heavy rain in, in uh, July and August that we added more seed crop, which really helps with the, um, you're going to lose your salts in that kind of period. And magnesium for us is a limiting factor um, that we, we start getting low on magnesium. So we add those. Um, we do, we do, what's that? What's that? Oh, oh. We do put right 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 as often as often as well, and then we have to consider that 100 day, 120 day manure rule for cert organic certification. We can't have um, animal manure 120 days before uh, you harvest a crop. We are organically certified and have been since 1987 from um, uh, basic organic certifiers now are the folks who certify us. There's just a picture of the wood chips. That's the truck they come in. We do get lots and lots of wood chips. Um, love them, love them to death. <laughs> here's a picture of some of the hay we got uh, into the winter last year. Um, and here's some other hay we got from another source. Um, just getting all that stuff together. This is the Johnson C composter. If you get your natural farmer, you'll see plans for that. Um, it's basically a big tank of leaves that you um, leave in there for a year and we water them every single day so we haven't harvested it yet but we did this back in february and you'll see this just taken last week um where we have our tomatoes still growing here and the composter was full of leaves and it's down you know to about halfway and this is what's looking like right now supposedly it'll be ready in um february and if you look at online and all about um some of the things that the that um, 
David Johnson has done at New Mexico State University is pretty impressed by the it's a fungal inoculant similar to Bokashi um, or um, Korean natural farming uh, products. So the idea with a fungal compost is that you don't turn it because you want the, the fungi to be able to really develop their strands throughout the compost and really break down the, the um, whatever your substrate is very, very um, carefully and thoroughly. Um, and as we found with the Korean natural farming um, compost that we've made, it's a very, uh, very uh, strong inoculant. It doesn't take much to do a lot. Uh, here's part of our process. Here are our three cows. Um, we moved them um, around uh, one side of the road this year. They had the whole winter. They got uh, uh, like a quarter acre, half acre um, a month for all the months of the winter. And really, we fed them out there, and you can see they manured their course and then planted there in the spring. And here are our turkeys. Um, they are about to move into our vegetable areas that are done for the year. Um, but right now, they're going through our orchards. Um, so they're going through our orchards and fertilizing around all of our fruit trees. So we're very uh, thoughtful about trying to get all of our open land um, uh, covered with some animal manure at least once a year that really builds a good quality, also builds a lot of quality um, for, the, for the fruit trees themselves. And then here are turkeys. Last year, we were taking them right through the field. So we'll, they move once a day, and it's just a way they eat down the residue and then depending on the time of year we might plant a cover crop before fall or do whatever else we're going to do to make it ready for the next year. Our pigs um, live on the corner, the edges of the, excuse me, on the edges of the farm. They go into the woods and also keep the, um, the trees back um, out of our fields. That's a real challenge in New England. Um, so, uh, just a way to, people often ask, well, how do you do these no-till beds? So, we used to have a, a four-foot four uh, walk behind, um, excuse me, um, a tractor-mounted rototiller that was went on the back of our Ford 2120. And so, uh, we've kept with that 48-inch bed size, and we have about a 20-inch um, pathway that we can mow easily. Um, what we've learned a lot this year, Brent, who works on our farm, is very good with the tractor, and he's really gotten, I'll show you a little bit later, but gotten really good with um, uh, renovating a, a bed um, or preparing a bed either way without, you know, just running the rotary mower, tractor rotary mower over it very, very uh, close to the surface. Um, and we can get in there pretty easily with our hose and just prepare and get right into plant. Um, we want to think about our situation, what was happening the year before always. So now is a really important time to be thinking what's going to go in. Uh, winter kill cover crops, um, uh, August, early September, it's a little late for that now, but um, you know, you can still use um, some rye and vetch if you have a way to kill those in the spring. Um, and hay is an also a very good thing to put down if you want to just you want to make sure your cover your soil is covered it's very much better if it's got growing things in it um, if that's not uh, appropriate or possible make sure that you have something on the soil to hold it in place um, we've been working with tarping um, and don't have a whole lot of experience with it but we had some good experience with it this year and we're going to probably buy about a half acre worth of tarps um, to uh, do some extensive tarping um, over the er into the, the early spring and, and get going with that. It works very nicely in season. Um, cardboarding over the winter is another option. You have to have something to cover it. What, you know, if any chips or, or leaves or hay or whatever you can find, um, you'll find when you cardboard over the winter that you're going to have um, very, very happy worms underneath it that in the spring when you start, when you plan. Um, and then staying on top of the grass invasion, now that's for us, you know, with a large enough system that we have that 
um, the grass does come back and we really need to stay on that um, throughout the season in order for it not to take over. There we go. Here's a picture of uh, um, some land. You'll see the three beds here that we um, had a struggle with. We had uh, strawberries growing there, and then we just had weeds going back too too much. We couldn't really um, deal with the strawberries, uh, doing deal with the weeds and, and take care of the strawberries. So we we came through and tarped this, and then um, this is shown. This shows after the tarping for about a month. Brent came through with the tractor, and you can see the lines for those three 48 foot beds, uh, 48 inch beds. Excuse me, wide. Um, or he, he mowed it and it's very much ready to go. And you'll see that armor I was talking about. You see there's a lot of stuff on the, on the soil surface. There's still a lot of chips in that bed too from previous use of chips. Um, oop, these turkeys are out of... Oh, this is, I'm sorry, that's, uh, this picture is our, our mower. It's our old rotary mower. <laughs> Pretty sad shape, but we just that's, that's our implement of choice for, for bed prep for these 48-inch wide beds. And here those beds are, we kind of lay out those sticks and strings, um, and you can see we've already planted in here and things are coming up. And you'll see also this nice uh, row of perennials up and down the next bed. This is something I learned from Michael Phillips, um, you know, reminder that it's so nice to have perennials um, stuck in your annual system because you have not only lots of good food, and we're getting some beautiful uh, uh, rosemary and thyme and sage and lemon balm and peppermint and spearmint and all these nice herbs and some flowers as you can see um, but you also bring a lot of more biodiversity into the system so that's always always a beneficial thing for everybody so rye um, vetch and grass are hard to eradicate and unless it's done early in the season excuse me um, we did try um, to kill, you know, these more perennial things in May and lots of work and probably did more damage really with our, our rogue hoe. Um, you know, so doing that without having some sort of a system like uh, a tarp, which we have found to work really well um, pretty quickly, um, or overwintering with cardboard or um, I'm not a real fan of... Um, Solarizing, I just don't feel that it does. I feel like it's too harsh on the soil to put down the clear plastic and burn everything. Um, Ryan Vetch are very incredible soil builders, so I find as much as possible if I can somehow build them into the system and then be creative for how to get rid of them. Um, that's what I'm looking for. And I've had some success, but I also, um, you know, point to Brittany Oversheimer, who's a very good grower in Eastern Mass, who's had very good success um, mowing it, mowing your Ryan Dutch, and then um, just for a month, you know, starting early May or early May to early June or early June to early July, being able to tarp that and come through and have that really very friable soil. So um, lots of lots of stuff to try always. Here's a picture of a, we got, uh, Heifer Project went under this year and they gave us some of their stuff. And one of the things they gave us were these tarps. And this is all we had were these two pieces of tarps. Um, the one, the piece in the middle you can see has already been tarped and you can see how it's brown with some of that armor I talked about. And then this is the tarp on the, on the land that's gonna be planted. Um, so tools of the trade, um, the rogue hoe, I, I'll show you a picture of it later, but um, they're really wonderful hoe. It's a heavy um, thing and it really does a nice job of, of um, helping you prepare and being a little bit heavier implement. We use a hand lawnmower, nothing fancy, you know, when we got um, down the street, you know, re reconditioned lawnmower and our tractor rotary mower, you saw how old that was our four twenty one twenty. And then lots of help. Um, we often have a lot of volunteers here, so we work you know with that pack that we have a lot of human help. Our um, one of our most important tools I think is the the backpack sprayer. Um, I just learned, especially as we get more our, our fertility worn place, which we've really been working seriously on for about ten years with mineralization and such, 
um, that having that sprayer to, um, you know, add the microbials and some of the liquid, um, you know, not, you know, not talking about fish so much. I don't really have, don't use much nitrogen. I don't feel that that's usually a, an appropriate thing to do when you have a system in place. But kelp products and a lot of these um, non-soluble, um, you know, some of the minerals, macro and micro minerals, along with the biostimulants and the um, microbials. That's a picture of the rogue hoe. Um, perennial weeds are a challenge um, in, the, in this no-till system in a way that they weren't before, although the annual weeds are not such a challenge. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but that grass is something that you really want to stay diligent with. I find that um, it comes back, um, you know, uh, pretty quickly and pretty easily. Uh, I don't want to be too harsh on it. I do keep grass pathways a lot because I do want to make sure that we have some that growing um, root system for the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, but you gotta gotta keep on it. Yellow dock is another um, uh, plant that we don't remember seeing so much before, but it's everywhere now. Uh, early in the season, we dug a lot and tinctured it, um, and so that's you know it's got that that good. As as do many of these perennial plants, they have a lot of medicinal qualities. Burdock um, is another big one with a really impossible root, and you need a shovel to get that one out. Uh, dandelions, um, very edible, very prolific. Um, we use those sometimes in a CSA. Certainly, I dry enough for dandelion tea every pretty much every day of the year. Um, cover crops like vetch, um, uh, dangerous weeds like bindweed. Um, both of these are good at very, you know, choking your plants. Um, the rye, which is hard to eradicate in the spring, and um, bindweed. Um, we seem to have such a plethora of bindweed this year. It's a really challenging one. Bishop's weed um, is another thing that got introduced to our farm. Um, someone said, um, you know, what do you do? Someone asked the question, what do you do when you have bindweed on your property? And the answer was um, move. <laughs> so this is one we're working on. Um, this all uh, was something that um, has come into our system in a way that I hadn't seen it before. Beautiful plant. Um, it's not, not too hard on you. It's a little, uh, hurts a little bit. Um, and slugs um, are, were a big issue for us this year. And then they were in 2016, not so much last year, but they were in 2016. So those are things that are, are kind of our challenges right now with our no-till system. This is a picture of the um, yellow dock, and you can see a lot of slug damage on that cabbage there. Here's a picture of bindweed. It'll grow up and um, really wipe out your perennials. Even going goes up into our fruit trees. We have to be very, really diligent with that. Here's the bishop swede um, coming and taking over in our rhubarb. And there's a little thistle plant. We had, I, it's kind of a weak looking one. We have some much nicer ones, but um, they're everywhere. And then here's the dandelion, just uh, a good, uh, good companion to have there, I think. And comfrey is not really what I think is a, a problem, but it can be. It, it'll come in everywhere, but it's a very strong, sturdy plant, but also has a lot of medicinal qualities and also can be chopped for mulch. Um, I showed the, here the picture of the chard early in the season this year. This was our crop that had the most trouble with slugs. Um, we're pretty much over that now, but we certainly struggled that, with that early in the, in the season. And here's some slugs in the uh, cabbage early in the season. Um, so some management details, if you dig too deep, uh, annual weeds will reappear. So it's always important, particularly when you're, you know, when you're preparing a bed or, or re-preparing a bed is to really, um, you know, I think one of the hardest things that people have is that they, we have all been taught that a clean seed bed is like nirvana, you know, it's the close to godliness kind of thing. And we want to get every single thing out and we want to um, make it really clean, whether we use a rototiller or a hoe or whatever we use. Um, what I notice if we don't, you know, we really would mostly we really want to just scrape um, whatever there is growing 
out of the way. And if you start to really dig deeply at all, you're going to have annual leaves coming back. Um, when the mulch, um, we uh, used a lot more mulch this year. And then some of the previous years, we used a lot more intersown cover crops. It, you know, we had a lot of mulch this year, and I um, it just was focused more in that direction this year. Um, you really want to make sure that you get it down at the right when plants are the right size before um, as quickly as you can. I find is is mulching is a really good thing. Uh, one weed and then a mulch. Um, weeding in a well prepared, well prepped bed system shouldn't be very difficult at all. It's really kind of thing that you do on the way by when you're harvesting. Um, and then living with you know, uh, some tolerance for lead, weeds, I think, is important rather than having, again, clean cultivation. I don't use any black plastic. Um, you know, just all we, all we use is natural things. Um, and I think I've talked a little bit about the bed turnover strategy with the tractor mower and such. Um, here was a little interesting thing that I noticed um, this year. I'm always doing, these aren't really side-by-side -side stories, but um, these are where we had potatoes um, on the left. We planted, a, dug a hole and planted the potatoes and then mulched them after they came up. And the, the potatoes on the right um, were in a, in a different field, really, but um, we just put the plant, planted the potatoes and then mulched it very heavily uh, right at the time. And the potatoes took a, long, a, a significant amount of time, longer time to come up. But the ones on the left died very early. They looked really good at the time, but it was right during the monsoon period, and we had a lot of rot. Um, these other potatoes we harvested a month later. We just harvested them, actually. Um, beautiful, monstrous potatoes with these thick worms everywhere. And these are earthworms that are, you know, as thick as your finger. Um, really, really nice. And these are these are some of those potatoes. You see, I. Um, Neglected to add more mulch, which we should have done. You see some greening there, but really incredible crop. These are just to show that, um, you know, carrots, the bane of our existence, probably a lot of people's existence. <laughs> but, um, that, you know, we did have some annual weeds in this area. Um, you know, it's not that we are weed free, but it certainly is much different than it used to be. So here's a little sequence I wanted to show you um, where we just put in some cauliflower plants um, after the, this was tarped. Um, we came through and mowed it, and then we just dug holes and put in the cauliflower. You see that there's still a lot of residue on the bed. Um, and here they are later with, um, and then we, as soon as we could, we mulched pretty heavily the same area. And then um, this is, um, again, that same area, the cabbages, um, and, uh, you know, really beautiful, high quality plants. And there's some of the cauliflower, um, you know, after you in that system. I think we found um, that uh, some of our best crops this year are in these places where we had some, of course, we had cows there. And then we had um, a lot of greenery grew back. Um, we mowed it and tarped it and then took off the tarps and planted. And that's where we had some of our best crops this year. Um, here's some beets. They're right in that, right next to that whole area I was showing you. Um, little beets that we, we, again, you're looking at a soil that's not a clean, clean cultivation. And you see this pathway um, between that I, you know, we tend to leave things in. Um, this is them emerging as from seeds um, out of the out of the soil. And then here they are now. And then you remember that beet that I showed you at the beginning. Um, some some of the highest quality beets I've ever grown on this farm. Um, Brent went out and mulched these really heavily with hay um, in the interim also. So it's a um, enjoyable system to work with. It's really enjoyable to go out and and pick really really healthy crops. Can't can't say that enough. Um, here's a, here's a um, picture that shows you um, on the left we had a um, early crop of not so good beets we had transplanted them in and then we had that dry period if you remember in May and June a lot of grass grew up um, we came through with the mower and then here we are 
two days later, Monday, that was Monday, and on uh, Brent came through with the tractor mower, and on Wednesday we came through um, and we're planting already. So the tractor mower, he comes through with a hoe and, um, you know, did these these rows and then put in these uh, Chinese cabbages and lettuces. You get a sense of the roughness of the um, terrain. It's not your, normal, your seed bed that I certainly grew up thinking was the right way to go. Here's an example of a couple beds that were um, lettuce, and we just came through and did what we would call a, a racing stripe um, with a hoe and just kind of pulled back some of that, um, uh, some of the residue, and then planted a squash seed down the middle of that, um, still harvesting squash in that area. So here's just a picture of some really good looking basil um, in heavy mulch. Um, I have to say though, after about the sixth week of rain, the basil all turned black and um, we lost that crop. Um, I did have to say too though, that even though a lot of people in Central Mass, I think um, had some serious um, losses this year, um, what we noticed was that we dipped around the middle of August, but about 10 days later, and I think uh, in large part, well, a, a lot of the practices, but I, I know that the foliar feeding and using those microbials and rejuvenate, which is another product from AEA, which really helps stimulate the soil biology to help the, the roots um, really do their thing. Um, we were able to really get back on track again and have some really nice fall crops again. Just a shot of some beans and corn, pole cool beans and regular beans and corn. Nice. That was a nice... Um, section there. Julie, mm -hmm. could you take a question at this point? Sure. Um, a viewer sent in a question about voles. She's in a no-till system and she's having um, heavy issues with voles. Yeah. Um, have Have you had issues with voles and how do you control them? Um, we do have a lot of wildlife in our system, but we have um, four cats and a dog, and now we just a new puppy today. <laughs> but those guys are out there in the fields with us all the time, and we don't uh, feed them as much as they need, so they do a little hunting every day. And I, I really can't say enough about having, um, you know, dogs are, might be harder for you if you're in an urban setting, but having cats and um, really um, encouraging that wildlife. And of course, uh, a lot of the wildlife, coyotes and other things will come in here um, into your, your habitat too. Um, you know, if you have things to eat, things will come. And we have, you know, millions of frogs and we have snakes and all those other things too. So, um, I, but I think uh, cats and dogs are really frontliners for us. Um, here's some peppers, um, exquisite peppers this year. Uh, just the best we've ever had. Too. This, these were in an area that was had been tarped cow, cow manure in the winter and then um, mowed and tarped and then um, planted into that rough terrain and then mulched heavily. Um, I was just taken by the color on the, um, the bean flowers this year. Now we struggle with a lot of, um, you'll see already some of the damage on some of these leaves here that are um, the Mexican bean beetle and some, some of the um, diseases that come in on beans. We certainly struggle with those. Some years we've lost them altogether. We're at a place now where we're getting, you know, maybe four weeks off of our beans before they go down. So I don't feel like we're totally where we want to be with the green beans, but what we'll see, what you'll see is this vibrant health of these really stupendously colored flowers. Um, here's some really um, incredible leeks this year and onions too that are left. Um, uh, really one of our best onion crops and our leeks. This, the leek bed to the furthest to the left, we harvested that one for, I don't know, six weeks. Um, really monstrous, incredible leeks. We're um, very happy with this system. And I think I, I, I showed you this one because uh, you see the grass in the foreground. Now that's where the onions were and all this is back quickly. Um, our, our strategy for this area is that we're going to come through our tricky tractors are gonna come back down through there um, and then we'll mow that and we're gonna cardboard that whole area and cover it with hay this year. Um, we're gonna do a quarter acre in uh, cardboard, a half acre in, in um, 
in tarps and then um, work with those early in the season and, and uh, kind of we'll see how see how we go with the rest of the farm but try to um, work work those systems around the farm um, just some this cucumber bed uh, just really outstanding uh, lasted 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 last we just took it out this year this week excuse me had to be two months of, of harvest of really high quality cucumbers that didn't, um, you know, it, it, it didn't die, really healthy land. These tomatoes look really good in here in this picture, but they're another one of those things like the basil that really took it in the chin. When we were underwater on August 14th, about two thirds of our farm was underwater. Um, was, after that, it got the early bite, gliding went downhill. We still have the tomatoes, but they really got a lot of disease, so did struggle a lot with the water, even though um, we didn't lose things completely. This is just to uh, give you a sense of um, the amount of hay we use. Those are those pepper plants early on, but really seriously mulched everything. And here they are uh, last week. Um, you know, really beautiful, um, waxy leaves and really vibrant plants. Oops, I guess we saw the leaks twice. And Here's uh, the chard that we were struggling with early on in the season. Finally starts to get this really, um, uh, it starts to build lots of lumps and bubbles and lots of ways that it's reaching out to do more um, solar collection so it can build its roots. That's what we're looking for. Here's some collards that um, really, um, collards is always a struggle for us. The, uh, the, um, Cabbage looper, and uh, you can see a little bit of damage from the slugs too, but really um, high quality this year. Oops. Um, uh, just some nice pictures of our, our kale. Um, we call this is our, uh, like a kale plantation. It was five beds, and you know we harvest um, several hundred dollars of the kale off of there every week and have been continuing. We plan to do that for quite some time going forward. Lost a couple pictures here. Let me see what happens here if I can go back. Oh, okay. Shoot, let me go. Let me try again here. See what happens. Um, let me try this again. Let's see. Let me try. Happening. You can always scroll down and uh, scroll down the pictures to the left to get to the ones you want to go yeah. to. Yeah, really do it. I can't get a big. I can't get this to be really big now. Also, but um, anyway, I'm almost there. Um, oh, there's just a picture of our our winter squash. Also, really high quality this year. Um, you know, cucurbits are something that have a very shallow root, and you, I think you want to be really cautious to um, make sure that, particularly when you plant them, that you um, use good fertility practices. I make sure that we do a really high-powered drench with a lot of those microbials. The beginning makes a lot of sense. I saw a note from uh, <laughs> Lucy, but I couldn't read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Actually, there was a question about weed seeds. How do you avoid bringing in weed seeds with the hay? I well, know that's a common issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are weed seeds in the hay. Um, here's a, I just want to show you this picture of this kale, this bed. And we just keep being amazed at how amazing, how big and beautiful this kale is. So here's the one I wanted you to see. Um, that is just, you can see how monstrous it is. Um, we do um, have weed seeds. I think that um, either, you know, whether you're using a, a good cover crop, intersown cover crop, or hay, or straw, you know, straw is um, prohibitively expensive. Um, we get a lot of trash hay from, from farmers who have picked it and it's gotten wet, and they can sell it to us for a reasonable price. Um, plus, we have our own hay, which doesn't have so many weed seeds, but, you know, they're there, they come in, um, but you know when you smother adequately with adequate um, with adequate uh, covering, whether it be leaves or hair, whatever you're using, 
um, they aren't such a, a deal. And you can see in a, in a planting like this kale planting, there's no room in there for anything to um, do much. There's a lot of stuff going on under there. There's some nice greenery happening. We did mulch them really heavily. Um, and there are some things growing under there. But um, I'm really happy for them to be there because they really are adding to the diversity in the system. So I'm not, I'm not so afraid of weeds. Um, and when I stopped killing, they, they became much, much less of a problem. So we aren't losing crops to weeds now like we used to. Um, OK, so slugs still a problem, especially early. I was listening to a, a, a John Kempf webinar. I encourage all of you to go on the AEA, Advancing Eco Agriculture website, and um, you know, get watch those webinars and do his podcast, et cetera. Um, a reminder that probably my my um, nitrogen is a little off. Maybe I don't have enough sulfur to match up with it. Um, we're gonna, you know, try to spend more time trying to figure that one out next year. Um, foliar feeding and tweaking um, those foliars as you get too much rain or whatever you get. Um, our lifesaver. We we put up, we hung up our drip tape. You probably saw it hang in the background in some of these pictures. Let me see if you can see it in that picture. Can't, I guess you can't. But um, the drip tape is gone. We we are no longer drenching. And now, of course, it rains way too much. This late late in the season, but early in the season it was quite dry. But we're finding with the increased soil carbon, we really don't need to drench anymore. Um, bouncing back quickly after the monsoons. Um, Using the tractor and um, you know very simple uh, uh, you know rotary mower for bed prep, um, cardboard and silage tarps are I find very useful. Mulching I can't say enough for mulch. Um, you know roost out back in the day 50s 60s and the was the the queen of the mulch you know mulch garden. I think that mulch is great, but we add to that we want to have lots of diversity in there too. So either diversity from one bed to the other or cover crops growing in your mulch um, you know just making sure that you have lots of different things going on more animals um more of the animals on the land each year we really work very hard to make sure that our animals are going through our our vegetable areas and our fruit areas and i encourage anybody who has animals to think about rotating them into your into your growing fields um, one of the things I want to do is actually work with AEA and do some tissue testing for the more intricate balancing, get a sense of really what's going on so I can be uh, much better targeted at, at fertility management. Microbial inoculants and stimulants are a priority. Um, they're, they're very cheap um, and they're very effective. Um, effective planning around cover crops and use nat nature's cover crops also and just that the taste is improving continually. So here's our grandson with a watermelon we picked last week. And then here he is with his brother. Um, we're, they're cutting up our melons so we can have a treat. <laughs> so this is what it's all about, is just enjoying enjoying that food. And that's, that's it. Sorry, I took too long. All right. Well, thank you so much. They look like they're enjoying that cantaloupe, too. Um, just just a few more questions. We really thank you and appreciate. Um, we really thank you for your time and appreciate the time of going over the lessons learned at your farm this year. Um, just a few questions as it relates. Um, you mentioned uh, inoculants at a certain point, and a viewer sent in a question. What is the best time to apply that? Um, every week. Every week. I mean, definitely, you know, when you're when you're doing your transplants, when you're starting your seeds, you know, foliar feeding your seedlings once a week, and when they're in the field, um, I really we we are very religious about doing our foliar feeding once a week. The, the highest, the most important thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned how much you use wood chips. Uh, how much do you use per bed, and when is the best time to put that down? So I um, have used, we have used wood chips um, in our annual systems more in the past, and we tend to um, put them more on our perennials now. Um, we have so many perennials that we, uh, you know, even this year have not even been able to get all of our fruit trees 
covered with um, you know mulch with, with wood chips. Um, again, when you have time, I guess, and you'll see once you start using um, mulch and once you start having a really active biological system that the um, microbial life and the worms are going to eat them up like you can't believe how fast they eat them up. So we, you know, we are, um, I think we, we wood chipped our, our black raspberries uh, twice this year and they were pretty much gone uh, by the time we got around to it the second time. So, you know, it, it, enough to keep things covered, I guess, is the, is the answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. And going back to um, keeping the soil, going back to the weed challenge, there was a question that came to via text um, about could leaves and wood chips act as an aid with uh, keeping the weed pressure down? Oh, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Anything you can find. And if you're by the ocean and you have seaweed or if you have old corn husks or, you know, whatever you can find. I, I, I don't like plastic. I, I fear if I'm going to put something on the soil, I want it to be food for somebody. Um, food for the fungi, food for the earthworms, food for the microbes of all sorts. Um, so whatever you can get your hands on is great. Okay. And, uh, what, and our last question for the night, um, you talked a little bit about uh, the different tools that you use, quite a bit of the hand tools. Um, would you consider, would you uh, think that broad forks and pitchforks could be good tools for turning over soil? Um, I don't know about a pitchfork for soil. Broad, broad forks, um, broad forks I think should be considered a temporary uh, tool. Um, if you are, running a good no-till system and you're adding a lot of um, whether it be uh, biomass from cover crops that like wintering cover crops that are going to die in the winter and the you know build the soil in, you know throughout the winter and in, into the spring whether you're using mulch I was thinking was thinking about our corn we harvested all of our corn this year um, but we have the stalks out there, and um, one of the varieties, silver queen, corn's long gone, but the silver queen, they're still growing. And they're, the, the root biomass that you get from a plant corn is pretty phenomenal, as, as is the root biomass from a, like a, a big kale plant or something. All those things are building the soil, and they're, um, if you leave those in the soil, they're going to help with the channeling um, so that the moisture can go down so that the earthworms can come up and that you have an ever increasing softer soil. So um, a broad fork is a nice tool, but it should, you shouldn't have to use it after a while. Um, you should be able to work in your soil and not have to um, aerate it in that fashion. You want to, you want to plan for your, for your um, large and small uh, soil life to be taking care of that for you. Okay. And then finally, for the, the final question of the night um, concerning how you uh, integrate your livestock, um, how often do you move the livestock um, around through your field? And what is it that they provide? Uh, what is it they're leaving behind in terms of nutrients? Um, you know, it really depends. If I, if I think about the, this year, what we had, our, our cows, like I said, were on about a quarter to a half of an acre for about a month. Um, and we had, they lived there in the winter um, on stubble. Um, and then we brought them hay and they, of course, left lots of manure. Um, the turkeys uh, move once a day. So they're on a spot and then they move and they're off of it. And that's it. The chickens are the same way. Sometimes with the chickens, they live generally in, the, in our pond, hay field, which is an orchard also. Uh, they might go through that twice in a year. And the cows might go through there too and we'll be cutting hay. The pigs, um, our plan for the pigs actually this year is our, we have a field that's about a half acre. And they have been living, you saw that picture of them along the woods. But they're going to move into this half acre of vegetable land for the last two weeks or so of their lives. And, you know, they'll root that all up for us and manure it for us. And then my idea is to plant uh, rye there and vetch and overwinter it and then um, 
mow it and tarp it in the springtime. So, you know, it, it's always, it's whatever you, whatever works. Um, if the chicken tractors, turkey tractors, well, I'll be taking them through the vegetable areas that are spent now, and they'll be there on the spot, you know, be like um, 25 chickens or 15 turkeys in, the, in an area for one day and then move on. Okay. Wow, well, that was our last question, and I tell you, um, this is, I think, going to be a, a, one of those archive pieces that you can go back and study, um, because this is definitely real-life teaching happening right in front of us. And again, we thank you so much, Julie, for your time tonight, just going over what you've learned and what you've experienced. Uh, every experience is, is a piece of learning, and I think we were blessed with that tonight. So um, stay tuned. Uh, if she mentioned John Kemp uh, from AEA. He will be the keynote speaker for the 2019 No From Mass Winter Conference, January 12th at Worcester State. So if you'd like more information, please go to our website, save the date, keep that on your calendar. Everything that Julie has talked about tonight, he will talk about in a little bit more. So if you want to hear it from the man himself, please be out uh, with us. Uh, if you want more information, you can also email me at Anna at nofamass.org. Uh, and also, this part, I just want to say to people that people can email me whenever they want to also and come to the farm yes. if you like. Happy to share whatever we're, we're learning. Did you, um, can you put up your contact information, Julie, one more time? Um, if you can go to that slide. I go back up there again, yeah. Yes. Um, there it is. Okay. So feel free to reach out to Julie directly. Um, also, this uh, video, this webinar will be up on our archive uh, screen, our archive page in YouTube uh, by the end of the week. If you'd like your own personal link, just reach out to me and I will send that to you. Uh, next month, uh, October, we'll be talking a little bit about some of the uh, regenerative processes that organic gardening can be used in terms of our incarcerated personnel. So we'll have Renee Portanova from the New Garden Society talking about the wonderful work that they do uh, within the Suffolk County prisons on the eastern side of the state. That is something that please um, remember, keep down that on your calendar. We will send you out uh, email reminder. Also bring a friend to that. Um, going back to the soil has a lot of health benefits and for those who are incarcerated, it brings a sense of peace and healing and we're looking forward to her presentation October 27th, same time at 7 p.m. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight, for taking time out of your busy schedules. We really appreciate you. Look forward to seeing and hearing from everyone next month, and have a great night. Peace.